Scholars uh, first webinar in a series um, on American history. And uh, this is going to be perhaps uh, two dozen webinars over the next year or so, ideally to be followed perhaps by other series on say American culture. We are inaugurating this one with uh, the Mayflower Compact, 1620, and the formation of the American Republic. I'm delighted to be able to present Daniel Dreisbach, a professor of American legal culture at American University School of Public Affairs, Mark David Hall, the Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics at George Fox University, and Peter Wood, president of the National Association of Scholars and author of 1620, a critical response to the 19, uh, 1619 project. Uh, the order, I believe, is going to be Hall, Dreisbach, Wood. Just before we get there, I just want to quickly say people should put their comments either into the chat or the Q&A buttons at the bottom. I will relay them on to professors when we've had our initial um, talks, uh, talks, moderated conversation, answering Q&A. Um, the professors can also look at the chat and Q&A themselves and see if there's anything exciting and interesting they need to address at once. Um, when this is all done, it will be recorded on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel for posterity. That will be within 24 hours, so anyone will be able to, you know, pass a link, uh, look at it again. And um, any questions of yours which don't get answered, please feel free to send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org. I will pass them on to the uh, panel participants so that they can have the chance to answer you. Uh, without any further ado, I believe it's Professor Hall. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is a real, a real pleasure. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the Mayflower Compact in, in a broader setting. I'm looking at the Puritans and the, the Pilgrims and how they approached politics and law more broadly. The first thing that needs to be said, and I'll be very brief in the historical background, but we need to understand, of course, that the Pilgrims are a product of the Protestant Reformation, specifically the Reformation in England. The English reformers, of course, decided, desired to purify the Church of England, for which they were given the name Puritans. Now, the Pilgrims are a, um, a separatist group of Puritans. They believe that each church constitutes its own body and that there should be no national church. And so the Pilgrims are a bit different from, from the Puritans in that respect. The Pilgrims, of course, famously went off to Holland so they could freely live according to the dictates of conscience in 1608. When that didn't work out too well, they came over to Massachusetts Bay, 1620, the date we're celebrating today. Now, before these English separatists departed from the Mayflower, they made an agreement that has come to have a, a great deal of influence in American history, the Mayflower Compact. The, um, the compact is important because its authority, its legitimacy stems from the consent given to it by the, the males on the, on, the, on, the, on the Mayflower. Now, some scholars, later scholars, have attempted to downplay this um, the importance influence of this compact they say well it wasn't really that well known until the 19th century or um, was even called the mayflower compact until the 1790s now these claims are disputed but even if true they're completely irrelevant because the mayflower compact stands in for a practice that the pilgrims and the puritans did all the time that is forming organizations um, ultimately aimed at glorifying god and their, author their legitimacy of their civic arrangements, of their ecclesiastical arrangements, their church governance, came from the consent of the, of the members of these organizations. So from an early, very early date, Americans are used to governing themselves by um, consenting, a government by the consent of the governed. Now, the pilgrims and the Puritans who followed them went well beyond that. Um, prior to the Protestant Reformation, most Christians thought of monarchy as the ideal form of government, perhaps monarchy checked by some sort of legislative body, but the focus was on uh, a, a king or a queen. The um, reformers, so those members of the Protestant Reformation, including the Puritans, including the pilgrims, 
um, came to a very different conclusion. They, they, they thought that Republican forms of government were the only legitimate forms of government. And they came to this idea through a kind of interesting path. Um, it was through reading commentaries by Jewish rabbis written in the 14th, 15th century. So Eric Nelson in his wonderful book, The Hebrew Republic Documents This in Spades, and he writes, and I want to quote here, to understand the Hebrew Bible, the reformers thought, one should consult the full array of rabbinical sources that were now, now available in the Christian West. One should, these are Protestants, should turn to the Talmud, the Mid Midrash, the Targums, and other medieval codes. And through reading these, the, the pilgrims and the Puritans learned to interpret passages such as 1 Samuel 8 as condemning the Hebrew people not for um, desiring a ruler other than God, but specifically for desiring a king. A monarchy is an illegitimate form of government, whereas the Republican form of government is God's ideal for his people. And so the Mayflower Compact fits into this very well, right? A civic government that finds its legitimacy based on the consent of the people. Um, the, the, the Almost everyone, almost every male, I should qualify, was able to participate in the, um, in the town government, hold offices, and this sort of thing. And again, it bears emphasis that, that the pilgrims and the Puritans are doing this sort of thing all the time, up and down Massachusetts Bay into Connecticut and, and elsewhere. Let me mention another idea that is being developed within this tradition that had that eventually came to have a very important impact on the um, American founding as we usually conceive of it. That is a series of events in the late 18th century where the American colonies broke from Great Britain and created the constitutional order under, under which we live today. Um, Calvinists, broadly, going back well before the pilgrims, um, were thinking very seriously about the extent to which Christians are obligated to obey a tyrannical government. Now, many Christians historically have viewed Romans 13 as requiring submission even to tyrannical governments. Um, of course, if the government tells you to bow down and worship Baal, you don't do it, but you take the consequences. There's no room for revolution or active resistance, as it might have been called by many um, many reformers. Under the, um, uh, the Protestant Reformation, thinkers like Calvin, who's actually among the more conservative of the thinkers in this respect, um, argued in his institutes that inferior magistrates may clearly resist a superior magistrate who becomes tyrannical. But even as Calvin is writing his, his institutes, you have John Knox up in Scotland, George Buchanan, the author of Wendekie Contra Tyrannos, who are making much stronger arguments that in fact, Christians have a duty to resist tyrannical authority and uh, maybe even private citizens may do so. So um, it, long before the war for American independence, these Puritans in England had a chance to put this sort of reform, there's, active resistance into practice. So I'll just give a few examples. In the 1630, uh, Massachusetts Bay citizens prepared to resist by force an order from, from the Privy Council uh, demanding that the leaders of the colony return its colonial charters. In 1649, the citizens of Massachusetts Bay rejoiced when Charles I lost his head. And in fact, John Cotton preached a sermon where he clearly approved of that action. After the restoration of the, of the British monarchy, the um, king and the Privy Council decided to improve the government of New England by creating this new entity called the Dominion of New England, where basically all of the New England colonies would be smushed together under um, the leadership of the royal governor. The second royal governor, a fellow named Andros, um, came over and immediately made himself very unpopular. He limited town meetings, the famous New England town meetings. He demanded that the Congregationalist Church open itself up for Anglican services and this sort of thing. And so when the citizens of Massachusetts Bay heard about the Glorious Revolution, they right away arrested Andros and sent him back to England um, for trial. They believed he would be tried there. He actually wasn't tried, but, but the Crown, I think, very prudentially decided to abandon this notion of the Dominion. Of, of New England. Now, I want you to note, um, to some political scientists, even to some historians, the American founding, the, the key ideas came out of the heads of John Locke, and specifically as articulated in the Second Treaties. Note that everything I've been talking about thus far predates the publication of the Second Treaties. Government by the consent of the governed, 
government, widespread participation of males anyway in the day-to-day -day affairs of governing oneself and the right to resist tyrannical authority. I have more to say about the um, Puritan legal reforms, but I think I will stop there and give my two um, fellow participants a chance to jump in. And then if they don't touch on that, maybe we can return to the um, legal reforms of the Puritans. Thank you very much. And thank you so very much. Um, without further ado, uh, Professor Dreisbach. Uh, you're muted still, I think. Thank you very much, David, and, and thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity to be a part of this conversation. Uh, in, my, in my remarks this afternoon, I, I want to focus on legal developments in New England, starting with the Mayflower Compact, uh, developments that contributed to uh, what I'm going to call an American constitutional tradition, and a, a tradition that's going to culminate with many state constitutions and the United States Constitution of 1787, that were framed in the wake of independence from Great Britain. The pilgrims who came ashore at Plymouth in 1620, followed by their theological cousins, the Puritans, who would later establish the Massachusetts Bay in 1630, were not the first Europeans, not even the first Englishmen to settle in North America. Yet, I'm gonna to suggest to you that they, more than any others, defined an American national identity and, and laid the, the foundations uh, for an American political tradition committed to the rule of law and constitutionalism. Now, as we've just heard from Professor Hall, the, the, the pilgrims were religious dissenters. They were theological separatists. Uh, and they had reluctantly concluded that the Protestant Church of England from which they had separated themselves was, was irredeemably corrupt, which necessitated their, their separation. They were a profoundly religious people who had experienced oppression in England at the hands of authorities in both church and state. And hence they took upon themselves this, this uh, dangerous journey across the Atlantic Ocean to escape persecution in the old world and to seek liberty in the new world. They, like their Puritan cousins who followed them, were on a mission to establish Bible commonwealths grounded on biblical principles and laws, at least as they understood them. They wanted to create uh, political communities devoted to, to God and committed to the rule of law. Their bold experiments in, in self-government birthed uh, a constitutional tradition that blended biblical law as interpreted through their uh, theological lens of re Protestant reform theology. But with that, they, they uh, blended into this tradition the common law of England as adapted to their particular needs as communities. And then in addition to that, they added developing local customs. And all of this would form a, a legal and constitutional tradition that, that continues to exert influence on, on American law and politics to the present day. The Pilgrims' condemnation of the established Church of England won them few friends and positions of power and influence in England. And so a small group had decided to leave England for the Netherlands, and, and after a season there, they eventually left uh, Europe for America, uh, bringing them to New England in November of 1620. Now, before they had left Europe, they had made arrangements with, with uh, the Virginia Company to settle in Virginia, but, but their ship, the Mayflower, was blown off course as they crossed the North Atlantic, and, and they made landfall off Cape Cod, uh, which was north of their intended destination. Now, their arrival in New England raised uh, a rather thorny political question, and that is, were they subject to English authority, specifically the Virginia Company, as they would have been had they arrived in Virginia as planned? William Bradford, one of the Pilgrim leaders and, and later the uh, colony's second governor, he reported that, that there was, and I'm going to quote here, discontented and mutinous murmurings among the non-pilgrims aboard the ship that their agreement with the Virginia Company was void and that they were now free or at liberty to do as they willed. This, of course, was uh, somewhat disconcerting to uh, some of the pilgrims to, to hear this kind of talk. And to remove doubts about the governing authority in their community, both the pilgrim and non-pilgrim adult men aboard the Mayflower entered into this social contract with each other, with God as their witness, as they prepared to come ashore there uh, at Plymouth. Uh, 
Uh, it's this agreement, this, this uh, contract of sorts that has come to be known today as the Mayflower Compact. It was, it was designed to nurture unity among the settlers and, and to facilitate a future civil government. Let me just note here as an aside, this is November 1620. This compact was printed and sold in London as early as 1622, making it accessible to a wider audience than those living in New England. So it is reaching a, a larger audience very early on in the life of the colony. In the tradition of uh, Old Testament covenants between God and his people, uh, the agreement was made, the pilgrim said, in the presence of God, that's their phrase. And underscoring the document's uh, sacred character, it began with an invocation, and I quote, in the name of God, amen, end quote. And this language in particular raises any doubt that the makers believe the document was in this tradition of, of covenant making. This is also the language that underscores the signatory's obligations and, and reliance to, and as well as reliance on God. One of the things that I think is interesting here is that at this moment, right, they've, they've arrived north of, of, of their intended destination, they could have considered declaring their independence from English authorities. Maybe not a realistic option, but at least a, a theoretical option, declaring independent from, from England, which might have been expected given their unhappy experiences in England. But they instead made a covenant, a constitution of sorts, uh, one that acknowledges their obligations to God and to king and country. They were not a lawless or anarchic people. To the contrary, this, this agreement of November 1620 demonstrated a commitment to, to the rule of law and to constitutionalism. William Bradford described this compact in his journal as, and again I quote, the first foundation of their government in this place, end quote. So what, what do we mean by a constitution? Well, a constitution is a political community's expression of its fundamental authoritative law. It's setting out basic principles of governance. Uh, uh, including the substantive components of government and, and the procedural rules by which government power is to be legitimately exercised. Scholars have, have, have debated whether or not the compact is a fully formed constitution. I think what we can say with, with some certainty, it is at least a proto-constitution, a, a seed of a constitution, uh, committing uh, the signatories to uh, creating, in the words of the compact, a civil body politic and to frame uh, and act and obey such just and law, equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers deemed necessary for the common good. But the very act and the manner of framing this agreement affirmed government based on the consent of the governed. This of, is one of uh, the most cherished of American political ideals. This was to be a government by consent of self-governing citizens, equal before God, equal before each other, and equal before the law. Both the high and the low in their community, the governors and the governed, and the pilgrims and the non-pilgrims were all to be answerable to the same law. And I emphasize this because this, of course, is a fundamental principle of rule of law. The compact, it has been claimed, is the oldest surviving declaration or social agreement in the modern world asserting rule by popular consent. And I think this is a, this is a claim that, uh, that has merit. Uh, this is a, a, a social compact, a contract of sorts, not dissimilar to, uh, to that seen in Virginia in the Declaration of Rights and, and Constitution adopted in June of 1776, or, or even in the Declaration of Independence uh, in the following month. My, my claim this afternoon is not that the Mayflower Compact is important because it was profoundly innovative in content and design. Indeed, I think it's almost certain that the framers drew on earlier agreements and, and earlier traditions. Rather, my claim today is that the Mayflower Compact is important because it is a vital link in the chain reaching back to old world civil and ecclesiastical constitutional traditions and connecting them to what would become an American constitutional tradition. 
a tradition that would produce the national constitution of 1787 and virtually every American constitution in between and since. This, this compact, the making of this compact was arguably the most formative event in the new world in the development of an American constitutional tradition. Although it's a, a, a remarkably brief document, just a couple hundred words in length, in its, in its simple structure and form is a pattern, a pattern that's evident in almost all subsequent American constitutions, again, including the American Constitution of 1787. In their little book uh, called The Basic Symbols of the American Political Tradition, uh, published in 1970, Wilmore Kendall and George Carey argue that the Mayflower Compact set a template for written constitutions. Although not original to the compact in all its parts, the same basic structure that we find in the compact would be used by subsequent constitutional framers in North America. This, this template, this constitutional uh, template begins appropriately with a clear identification of those for whom the document was created. This, this act of identification is found in the compact's second sentence, which says, and I quote, we whose names are underwritten, end quote. It shouldn't be overlooked, by the way, that the document further identifies the framers as, and I quote again, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. I, I think this confirms that the signers, again, were not lawless rebels. A similar statement of identity is expressed in the U.S. Constitution, and, and of course, those famous words, we the people. This is followed by a statement of purposes for their political society. As the, as the compact puts it, they are formed for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country. We're going to find a corresponding statement of purposes for the National Charter of 1787 in, in the noble aspirations of, of the preamble. Those famous words, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. It's here that the framers of the compact then enter into the solemn covenant to create a civil body politic and the attendant just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. Again, we find equivalent language in the U.S. Constitution where we read, we do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And of course, this is then followed by six articles defining the structures, uh, the institutions, the processes, and officers of this new constitutional regime. What's, what's missing from the compact, what, what that one might expect in a fully formed constitution are the specific nuts and bolts of governance. This was left to be worked out in future, uh, in, in the future. The absence of these nuts and bolts of governance is why some, I think, uh, scholars describe the Mayflower Compact as something less than a fully formed constitution. Finally, in identical language, and I quote, in witness whereof we have here unto subscribed our names, end quote, both the Mayflower Compact and the U.S. Constitution conclude with the framers' signatures, indicating, I think, their pledge of mutual commitment and obligation to each other and to the common good. And of course, both documents also are dated with reference to the birth of Jesus Christ. So what I think we see here in the Mayflower Compact that's going to be of some enduring importance and significance is, is the outline, the form, a template that future American constitutional framers would use. Again, just to review, it's an outline that begins with an identification of those for whom the Constitution is framed. It then includes a statement of purposes and aspirations it then creates a civil body politic and then concludes with a pledge of mutual commitment and obligation, which is affirmed, of course, by their signatures. More generally, the, the compact is a noteworthy expression of a commitment to the rule of law, legal equality, and self-government in an emerging American constitutional tradition. Thank you.
and thank you so much. Um, our next uh, the final of our three speakers is Peter Wood. Peter. Uh, and you're still muted, I believe. Double, double <laughs> unmuting oneself. Um, well, I am not a historian or a political philosopher. I'm an anthropologist and somewhat like the uh, Mayflower, I was driven off course and arrived at a place I didn't expect. Uh, I was driven off course by the winds of the New York Times' 1619 project. And when I set about trying to make sense of that, I landed on the uh, uh, outskirts of uh, Cape Cod with the uh, November 11th, 1620 signing of the Mayflower Compact. Uh, I had not intended to do this, but uh, since uh, Professor Dreisbeck has given us this close reading of the Mayflower Compact, I thought it might help to have a consecutive reading of the whole thing. It's very brief, fewer than 200 words. So here goes. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancements of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do, we, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, under which we promise all due submission and obedience. That's it. Um, well, what to make of this? I think Professor Hall and Professor Dreisbeck have told us who the pilgrims are and why this uh, document stands as a, at least a proto-constitution of the United States. Um, I'm going to start elsewhere. Uh, among the signers of it was uh, one Stephen Hopkins. He was a, a notorious ruffian, someone who had uh, been sentenced to death at Jamestown on an earlier uh, venture into the New World, had survived a hurricane, went back to England and had been running an alehouse there. He and uh, two of his servants were among the uh, 41 people, I think it was, who signed the Mayflower Compact. And I take that to be significant. This was a compact that included the non-pilgrims, who were in fact a majority of the people aboard the 102 passengers of the Mayflower. Um, and it represented a, a kind of extension of the authority that um, William Brewster and William Bradford, who are usually thought of as the authors of the Mayflower Compact, they were extending uh, a hand here to people who were unhappy with them. These were quarrelsome people. There had been fights aboard the Mayflower. Uh, they were short of provisions. They were arriving in the new world at the onset of winter with uh, an uncertain welcome from the native inhabitants. This was a period in which this whole enterprise could have fallen apart. Um, they could have fallen into deeper quarreling, which probably would have been a disaster. But instead, they came to a, a genuinely uh, open agreement. These were people who didn't have to sign, and they did, uh, among them being people whose uh, reputation probably designated them more as troublemakers and ruffians than as uh, uh, devout in any sense, uh, loyal subjects of the king. Um, this was a group of people that included dural minors, people under the age of 21, males signed the Mayflower Compact. That gives a lot of warrant to what Daniel Webster was saying about it 200 years later on the uh, uh, 200th anniversary of the Mayflower Compact. Webster was pointing out that this uh, community that resulted had no lands yielding rents, no tenants rendering service. Uh, essentially what's buried in the Mayflower Compact is the abolition 
of the forms of old world hierarchy, which all of these people would have been used to. So there is both a recognition of the sovereignty of the King of England, but also a sly move out of his authority into a new kind of social compact, one that comported with the uh, Pilgrim's uh, sense of being a republic before the eyes of God, but which also uh, welcomed into that community people who had no part in it, who just happened to be on board the ship. Um, the Pilgrims were supposed to be arriving in the New World on board the Speedwell, a different ship that sprung a leak, Bradford thought it was deliberate by the captain, that then sailed back to London and they crowded on board the Mayflower, which had originally been intended to bring only the uh, people who had signed up through the London merchant adventurers to be colonists in Virginia. So crowded together on a ship that was meant to hold only half as many people, uh, they arrived in the New World, they had a rough passage, they decided in the end not to uh, turn this into an occasion of uh, further dissension, but an attempt to create a community. Well, what does an anthropologist make of this? I think that it's correct to see that there's a hint of a republic, although they're recognizing the King of England as their sovereign. This looks forward to a community that knows how to govern itself. There is embedded in it, without being explicitly stated, a principle of religious tolerance, because many of the people signing the Mayflower Compact were not pilgrims. And this was going to be a community that operated by consent, uh, Professor Hall's key word, and that consent meant a consent across religious lines. Other people on signing this were regular members of the Church of England. Um, there was, within that sense of religious tolerance, something that the, uh, the pilgrims actually lived up to, not so much the Puritans, that next wave of uh, settlers that came along, but the pilgrims never broke down into religious persecution of the religious minorities amongst them. Um, that, that radical diminishment of hierarchy is here in America uh, for the first time. That wasn't going on in Virginia, the earlier colony, uh, which created its own House of Burgesses the uh, year before under the direction of the Virginia Company. So uh, a kind of self-government may have already begun to exist in Virginia the year before, but this was something new, something in which every single male member of the uh, passengers aboard the Mayflower uh, was thought of as an equal participant in the venture. Um, this was a negotiated unity, a community that decided that it was going to be uh, one thing, but it didn't decide to do that by having uh, the titular leaders of the group say, now we're a unity and we're going to behave according to one set of laws and we'll tell you what those laws are. Instead, they negotiated them and they laid that out in this document. This was going to be a uh, that key regnant phrase, a community of just and equal laws, equal and applied to all. It was going to elect its own leaders, which it did. Uh, and it managed a succession within the first year as one of those leaders died and Bradford stepped in to take his place. Uh, the uh, saints and ruffians together, uh, or at least the saints and the not so saintly settlers decided that this was going to be a community that operated uh, on a ongoing basis. There's that another key phrase from time to time. They weren't simply setting down a set of rules that were once established and going to be enforced after that. They expected to make changes as they went along. And so they did. Um, the general good um, of the ordering of this community there's a sense here that they didn't know what was coming. So they were not attempting to foresee every bit of the future, but they realized that there would be troubles. Uh, once they had established Plymouth Colony, they were able to reach accommodation with uh, the Native Americans of the time. Uh, they also expected to be perhaps harassed or invaded by the French. And one time there was a ship sighted coming near them that they thought might be a French vessel. They summoned essentially the militia. Uh, that is all the members of the community took up arms. Turned out to be a false alarm. It was a British ship, but the uh, 
uh, the idea here is that this was a community that was strong enough and confident enough to raise its own self-defense when needed and to enter into essentially a military alliance with one of the native peoples in the area against others. Uh, those uh, situations remained intact. This was a community that not only theorized itself into existence, but put that theory into practice. It maintained its treaty with the Indians for the whole life of uh, Plymouth Colony before it was absorbed into and taken over by the later Puritans. So what we have here, I think, is a, a pretty clear instance of Americans figuring out how they could be, if not independent, at least uh, self-governing in the practical sense. They thought it through uh, succinctly in, that, in this document of November 11th, but they also became capable of turning that into practice, which is at least as important as being able to uh, think out what it should contain. Um, we are, I think, left in viewing this document, at least as for me and as of this moment, as uh, something that has been uh, demoted in our sense of American history. One can turn to that uh, unfortunately popular book, uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of the uh, America, and we end up with finding that the Mayflower Compact is not even mentioned and there are just two bare passing mentions of Plymouth Colony. What has happened is that uh, the historians vogue for the idea of uh, uh, the Atlantic world has displaced what happened in New England. It treats the slave trade, which hadn't really begun yet. It treats the uh, uh, planters of the middle states or what were to become the middle states as having vastly more historical importance and what happened on the coast of New England in 1620 and the years following. I think that's a, a grave mistake. What happened at Plymouth and, uh, and subsequently in other parts of New England was the invention of a form of uh, local self-government. The template that uh, was put in place there is not only a precursor of uh, 1776 and later on the US Constitution, it was a plan of self-government for a small group of people living on the edge of the wilderness that became the plan of the New England town. And just as the New England town became eventually for the whole country, the template of how we should settle this land and govern ourselves in the process with a fairly generous spirit of tolerance to people of different views and a real willingness to recognize that we were not going to be ruled by an aristocracy not a hereditary aristocracy like in England or an aristocracy made up of the uh, wealthy and most powerful, that we were going to rule ourselves with a, a franchise that was going to be extended to all. Um, and I think that is the reason why I wanted to begin this series of uh, historical uh, excursions by looking back to 1620 as a key founding date for America as a concept, as a place where we had the capacity to govern ourselves uh, under God with respect for the rights of others and with a uh, sense that uh, the separation that would be needed from the uh, mother country was just going to be a natural part of it. We couldn't expect the King of England to rule us directly. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you all three. Now, before I get on to any more directive questions, uh, do any of you have questions for one another or comments or follow-ups you'd like to make? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, I actually, I, actually, I want to actually go straight to a question from a commenter. We've got, which I, because frankly, better than any I can come up with, come up with immediately myself. Uh, Keith Whitaker, what legal force did the Mayflower Compact have? How was it used in the colony after November 11th, 1620? Well, I'll take the first shot at that. Um, if, if my reading of the Mayflower Compact is correct, and, and, and uh, I'm open to, to being challenged on this, uh, it doesn't create a government per se, but what it does is it creates a space 
for the nuts and bolts and institutions and officers of a government that would be created in the aftermath. Uh, it's not unlike uh, features that we find in, in uh, other kinds of, of constitutions. Uh, there are a number of places in the United States Constitution where it leaves open the possibility for the creation of subsequent institutions and, and offices. Uh, take, for example, both Article 3 and, and Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9, give Congress the authority to flesh out a judicial system. Having created the Supreme Court, there's space there to flesh out a judicial system. And, and that's the way I see the Mayflower Compact. It is this agreement, it's this social contract that says, we agree to, cre to, to, to uh, uh, create and be bound by uh, the institutions and structures that may, we may agree upon at a later date. And so I think that's what we see taking place there. And in that sense, it's going to have force for uh, a number of years uh, into the future. Uh, but, but the way that colony is going to develop in its governance is using that, that open authority to create a civil bo body politic in its specifics at a later date. So it, 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 it continues to bind them, but it doesn't necessarily actually create the institutions and offices of, of governance. Professor Hall or Peter? Well, I'll add this, that we have uh, Bradford's of Plymouth Colony, which uh, describes the laws that eventually were enacted within the colony. And we know a good bit about how those laws were enforced. Uh, this was a system in which uh, punishments were meted out where, where needed. Uh, there was enough uh, sort of oomph behind the uh, Mayflower Compact that those who chose to go off and uh, found other settlements were able to do so and use this as the, the model by which they could be accomplished. Uh, so as a general framework, it was soon filled in with more specific laws and it was abided by. There is, I believe, no record of uh, uh, people dissenting saying, no, no, you're not living up to what we agreed to in the compact. Uh, in, instead, it becomes a, a living part of this community and, and not forgotten as a document. Clearly, it, uh, it not only was republished in England, but it became a kind of common property of the American people, which at least 200 years later was well recognized as such. It's only in the last probably 40 or 50 years that we've become amnesiac about what it entailed. I would also add that every historical account uh, crafted by the pilgrims themselves, that, that uh, first generation of pilgrims, begins their story in the New World with a recounting of the Mayflower Compact. Uh, that's, that's their starting point. Uh, in the way they tell their own story. So uh, it suggests to me that this looms very large in, in their own vision of their political experiment. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to, if, if there's nobody else adding to that, I'm going to shift to a different question and then push a bit beyond it. Uh, George Seaver, was it collectivist? And I want to add to that, I, I believe I've read elsewhere that it, that uh, Plymouth started out with you know, experiments on more communal economic ownership, which it then gave up. Uh, and that this is perhaps an example that this sort of thing did not necessarily work out so well, if I'm remembering this. But can you uh, comment on the effect, the, the economic structure of Plymouth and what that legacy is? I can say a little bit about that. Perhaps the others will add to this. Uh, during that first winter, uh, most of the adults died. If you actually look at the demographic composition of uh, Plymouth Colony in early uh, 1621, it's a, uh, an orphanage. And um, under a situation like that, one would expect there to be rather unusual measures of how to conduct things. So yes, their initial approach to uh, the farming of the land was communal. It didn't last very long at all, but uh, that was the, the initial idea. And uh, 
So we did have, an, I guess you could say, an early experiment in communism with the usual results. They nearly starved to death. Okay. And if nobody else is following up on that, I actually have a sort of a fascinating alternate history, which uh, Dean Williamson, in effect, you know, they were originally headed for Virginia. Um, you know, what were they expecting to achieve in Virginia? You know, a degree of autonomy, complete freedom. Um, what, in effect, and I, I said the follow-up would be what they intended, what, would, what could we have expected if they had, in point of fact, ended it up somewhere near Jamestown? They were, in fact, headed to Virginia, but uh, I think we have to hasten to add, this is not Jamestown. This is part of the land accorded to the Virginia Company, and there was more than one Virginia Company over the course of, uh, of many uh, decades, but uh, I think their actual destination would have been, where they intended to land, would have been much closer to New York uh, and the Hudson River, because that's as far as the patent lands extended for uh, the Virginia Company at that time. So uh, I don't think uh, we're, we're thinking here of one colony on top of another in the vicinity of Jamestown. They really were uh, headed uh, uh, far north, but as it turns out, they ended up even north of where they intended to be uh, off Cape Cod. I'll, I'll just add briefly, I think the results would have been pretty similar if they had la landed where they intended to land. Um, the pilgrims and the Puritans who followed them gave lip service to their loyalty to the king, but I think their intent all along was to find a place where they could implement their biblical vision for what society and politics would look like. And you see this, they, they massively revised the legal codes that they brought over from England in a variety of ways, most of which are, are liberating, and they adopted Republican forms of government that were far, quote unquote, more progressive than what they had in England. So yeah, I think they probably would have done the same thing had they landed in um, Virginia. Thank you. Um, query from Linda Cohn, um, you know, there were women on the Mayflower, about 18 adult women, uh, none signed the compact. Is there any indication that there was any thought given to the idea of women's participation in the body politic? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think that was a horizon beyond which they could not see. I, I believe that's exactly right. I will point out, though, that um, many people in this Reformed tradition, this Calvinist tradition, with its heavy emphasis on the, um, uh, on the Bible and the priesthood of all believers, we're beginning to understand that all men should read, but women should read as well. So we're beginning to see the advance of female literacy in New England, especially that goes well beyond anything we've ever seen in the world before and what will continue to be the case very, very long on continent, in continental Europe. I have a number of questions here, in, in effect, about the, sor the intellectual sources of the Mayflower Compact. And in effect, you know, one person taking some issue about the Hebrew uh, rabbinical sources, you know, and talking about the Greek and Latin sources, somebody else is asking about, you know, th therefore, the relationship between the Mayflower Compact and the Magna Carta. And then something else, you know, what precisely is the tradition of biblical constitutionalism, biblical republicanism? And I guess I would say that these, there is a certain urge to d dive a little deeper into the different intellectual, political, constitutional sources for the Mayflower Compact. And I guess if you could, each of you, if you think there was an effect, you know, more stuff you wanted to add in the details for that um, to respond to these different queries. Well, I'll take a, I'll take a, a stab at that to, to at least begin this uh, part of the conversation. Uh, you know, much as uh, I suggested in my, in my remarks that the Mayflower Compact is drawing on constitutions or constitutional-like documents, both ecclesiastical as well as those of the civil government. And so I think we see evidence of that in the Mayflower Compact. Probably the source that has been most pointed to as an intellectual source on the Mayflower Compact is essentially a, a, a statement of church governance with, of the pilgrim congregation in the Netherlands. Uh, one probably written by their minister, John Robinson, uh, 
who was the man who delivered a sermon and prayed over them as they departed from the Netherlands for the New World. Um, but you see in, in Robinson's writings a number of, of ideas and fr phrases uh, that, that uh, seem to resonate in the Mayflower Compact. Uh, as we move on to uh, Massachusetts Bay, uh, we're going to see even uh, other more obvious and apparent influences. Uh, again, drawing on a blend of biblical law as well as, uh, uh, as the British common law tradition. Um, so take, for example, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, which is one of their first great governing documents written in 1641 after several false starts at crafting a, a governing code for Massachusetts Bay, uh, begins with Article 1 and 2, which seems to be drawn from Articles 39 and 40 of Magna Carta, with strong language of, of due process and, and, and rule of law and legal equality. So you see that influence, but the, 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 the body of liberties then quickly moves into a number of pr provisions that, that reflect very strong biblical influences, um, various ideas. Uh, take, for example, uh, limitations on the extent of punishment, uh, limiting the amount of, of punishment to 39 or 40 stripes. Now, this is not a common law concept, but one that comes straight out of Mosaic law. So as we look at, at, at evolving constitutional traditions and legal codes in New England, I think we're going to see them drawing on, on these, on these uh, various uh, traditions, most notably biblical law and in particular Mosaic law, but also on, on elements of, of British common law. But let me just add to that last comment. Of course, uh, the, the, the most eminent authorities of, of the common law always said that the common law itself was based on scripture. So uh, there is a, a, a lot of sort of mutually reinforcing sources of influence on, on the laws of these Bible commonwealths there in what is today Massachusetts. Can I build on that answer real briefly? The, um, in England, you could be put to death based on circumstantial evidence. The Puritans in Massachusetts Bay read Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin or any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses. That's a, that's a mouthful, but basically it's a requirement that you have two witnesses, not circumstantial evidence, but two witnesses before someone is able to be put to death. Similarly, a third, literally a third of all English criminals in this era were sentenced to death. And you could be sentenced to death for taking a, a deer in the king's forest, for stealing a shilling, a very, very tiny amount of money. The American Puritans, on the other hand, read Exodus 22.4, if the theft is certain, found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or a donkey or sheep, he shall restore it double. So the Puritans, instead of putting people to death for thievery, required restitution, returning double the amount that was stolen. And they, they, they radically re reformed the legal codes that they had brought over from England. I'm not denying at all. Of course, they were influenced by the common law and the Magna Carta, uh, but they were engaged in their own project to create these biblical commonwealths. I have a question which I want to push on a bit. Uh, John Wormuth, um, Brewster was the only college educated person aboard, was his view on governing the one that dominated the party. And I want to build up on that. What was the specifically pilgrim attitude towards college education as distinct from that of Massachusetts Bay, which as we all know, Harvard, et cetera, was you know, very pro college education, um, but, but in fact did Co collegiate education have such authority uh, with the pilgrims? Well, I think there is uh, a, a certain class issue at play here. Um, I, I would hasten to add that while Brewster is identified as the only college educated among those who came uh, across on the Mayflower, there are certainly other college educated leaders among the pilgrims, including some that had remained in the Netherlands, intending to come over at a later date. Uh, 
so it, it's not as if uh, a college education was something that was was frowned on or or anything of that nature. Uh, and when we speak of of, of the pilgrims who come, we're we're talking here about a very a, a very small number. But I think you're you're it, it's an accurate uh, observation to uh, to make that. Uh, we're going to find a, a much broader uh, uh, class of individuals, especially the clergy class that, that are going to come over to Massachusetts Bay that uh, are college educated and, and, and bring a high level of, of education with them. Anyone else on that? Um, so there is a question about uh, Lois uh, Kanashiki, I believe. Can you speak more about who was allowed to participate in the government? You said most males. And again, just to uh, push this a little bit, in effect, what is in practice is the democratic ethos of Plymouth? I mean, how, how democratic is it? How democratic is it by the standards of England and the continent? How democratic by our standards? I'll take a brief stab at this and then people can build on it. It's a very difficult question to answer because you have Plymouth Colony, you have Massachusetts Bay, eventually you have um, Connecticut and these um, things shift back and forth in various ways. I can say in Plymouth, I believe for um, non-separatists were allowed to participate in the civic life of the colony. It was, I believe they eventually did adopt a, um, a, a religious test for participation, but it was decades and decades later. Um, some colonies adopted property qualifications in order, in order to vote. Um, in the New World, though, it was fairly easy to meet these. And so certainly by the time we get into the late 17th century, well over a majority of males, well over a majority of males could participate in colonial life, vote for people, have old civic office. And some of these are uh, regimes are just radically democratic or Republican. They probably would prefer democracy was sort of a bad name. So, for instance, in Connecticut, you have the 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 electorate, the, the white males who owned land. I say white males. I'm not sure there was many alternatives. Native Americans, I suppose, but they not would not have been considered citizens. Upwards of 70, 80 percent could vote. They voted for members of the lower house, members of the upper house, and they even voted for the governor. And they had elections every um, six months. So, you know, very, very um, Republican slash Democratic. I have a question then also. Um, the ruffians, uh, Dean Williamson. Um, what, well, what were their motivations uh, for the ruffians for coming along? What was the pilgrims' attitudes towards the ruffians you know, and how they could be incorporated? How much did the ruffians' attitudes themselves uh, become part of the, pilgr uh, the Plymouth ethos? Well, we have anecdotal answers to that, I, I guess. Uh, of course, ruffians was uh, my term, the pilgrims <laughs> called them strangers uh, and treated them with considerable respect. They brought skills that the, uh, the pilgrims themselves didn't have. Uh, the uh, Stephen Hopkins was an experienced uh, New World explorer and had experience with Native Americans as well as uh, with the hardships of living in this area. Uh, people had to survive initially by by hunting and gathering, and uh, those uh, were respected skills, whoever brought them. So um, we have uh, all, quite a few anecdotes via uh, the Bradford's Chronicles about how these people behave. It appears that uh, for the most part, they were respected, although uh, their ruffian ways continued. They would sometimes get in trouble or get lost, and they posed uh, uh, some trials for the community as well as some benefits. But on the whole, this was a community that was desperate for additional people. When another ship arrived with uh, uh, recruits that were uh, disappointed with what they found and thought they would get back on board and sail on, on south to uh, more hospitable places, the uh, uh, Plymouth Colony people uh, did everything possible to prevail to keep them there. So I think the need for manpower or, or in women power uh, was a uh, uh, 
pronounced factor in treating each other with respect. They could not afford to lose people, especially after that devastating first winter that took so many of the adults out. Uh, uh, the records that we do have seem to point towards uh, a spirit of accommodation. And even though there were troubles ahead, uh, they were not so severe as to challenge the general sense of equality before the law. There's the Maypole of Marymount uh, affair, which uh, uh, the Nathaniel Hawthorne gave us a fictionalized account, but that was real. We sent, uh, we, we pilgrims sent an expedition off to Cape Cod to uh, disrupt a, a rival colony that was uh, engaged in too much frivolity as well as interference with the local fur trade that was going to be uh, Plymouth's uh, ace card. I, something else to throw in here, it's a little bit out of order, but you know, this colony was established without the permission of the crown. And one of the very first things which uh, Bradford and others set about doing was trying to convince the crown to give Plymouth official standing as a colony, give it a charter, which never happened. They, they were refused that from beginning to end. So they remained a kind of uh, outlaw uh, colony, uh, self-governing and professing loyalty to the crown but the crown was having nothing of it. Can I say a word about the uh, Marymount? I, I think this is one of the reasons the Puritans are so easy to dismiss. We learn of them through Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story. Um, what is it? The, well, I have it. The Maypole of Marymount and the Scarlet Letter and um, the Crucible and this sort of thing. Um, John, John Turner, in his recent book, uh, They Knew They Were Pilgrims, has an excellent account of this Marymount affair. And he suggested, as you did, Peter, that there were a lot of issues at play. One was economic competition for the fur trade, but there was also a very strong belief that this fellow named um, Thomas Morton was selling weapons to the Native Americans. So this was posing a real existential threat to Plymouth. And so you, know, you read Hawthorne, you think it's just gloomy Puritans attacking fun-loving rebels. Uh, but the, the story is a lot more complicated than that when you dig into it. I have a question, actually, I guess more for the, the end of, therefore, the Plymouth colony. And part of the question, therefore, is what is the influence of Plymouth within broader New England, particularly as it gets dissolved into broader Massachusetts and, you know, the broader Puritan world? And so there... I guess, what is the direct influence of Plymouth on Massachusetts Bay? And then as Plymouth does end and get dissolved into broader Massachusetts, what aspects of it are remembered? What aspects of it are influential going forward? For anybody. I, I'll take a stab at what I think I understand. So I think some of the great students of Puritanism of the mid 20th century are completely dismissive of Plymouth. It was a small little colony that was swallowed up and it had no influence. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but it's my understanding that Michael Winship, who is, has argued that in fact, Plymouth went on to have a great deal of influence throughout Massachusetts Bay, particularly in ecclesiastical governance. So you have, um, you, you really don't have something equivalent of the national church. You certainly have congregationalism as the established religion, if you will, of Massachusetts Bay, of Connecticut, but it's a very ground up sort of thing, right? Where the local congregation has a great deal of authority, um, chooses who the minister will be, when the minister will be fired and this sort of thing. So I think, yeah, the, the, the current scholarship says that, the, um, that, that Plymouth did in fact exercise a great deal of influence. I, I think in these Republican sort of ways, both in terms of church governance, but also politically. It's not necessarily the case. I, I've tried to spin out a um, pretty strong connection between reform theology and this republicanism, but that's not a necessary connection. So there was another Puritan colony down at Providence Island, which was in the Car Caribbean, and this colony adopted um, a very hierarchical sort of government, and it failed very, very rapidly. Well, I uh... I will add to this only that uh, I'm with Daniel Webster in thinking that uh, Plymouth, even as it ceased to be uh, an independent colony, uh, became the 
conceptual base for uh, the settlement of New England and eventually even beyond New England. Uh, that is, uh, even the Puritans who took them over were learning a lesson about creating a, an actually viable colony, not an easy thing to do. Uh, there were plenty of instances of colonies that failed and uh, what the pilgrims succeeded in doing or the pilgrims and the strangers together succeeded in doing was showing a, a viable path that, that constitutionalism that uh, uh, Professor Dreisbach was uh, focused on, I think is the legacy here. We are discovering how it is that a group of people not actually bound by any bonds that require them to uh, work together, figure out how to do exactly that. Um, now, variations come into play and the, the Puritans are a different kettle of fish. They are uh, uh, more oppressive by today's terms than the pilgrims ever were. But uh, the pilgrim ideal, I think, is still in there. I will add then another question if there's not another follow-up um, Mar from Martha Francois. Uh, were there any members of the early Plymouth colony who were not free? Uh, that is to say, was the Pilgrim colony one that recognized slavery? I believe not, but um, there were servants. Uh, I mentioned uh, two of them already, Edward Doty and uh, Edward uh, was it Leicester, who were uh, Stephen Hopkins' servants. Uh, so in, indentured servitude was a, uh, uh, a reality and uh, people are not totally free then, but um, I suppose the, the question back to the questioner is what do you mean by free? Well, in and in, um, actually, were there any slaves ever in the course of the Plymouth colony before it uh, dissolved? To my knowledge, no. I'm hearing a resounding silence there. All right, to our knowledge, no. I, I'm not sure about Plymouth per se. Certainly you do have slavery throughout New England. Um, never, never, never is important um, for the economy or as widespread as it was in the American South. One, I don't have the exact date on the top of my head. I think it was in the 1640s. So a Portuguese um, captain showed up in Massachusetts Bay with two Africans that he had captured in Africa. The, um, the, the pilgrims or the Puritans considered charging him with violating the biblical pro prohibition against man stealing. And they, um, they ended up not trying him because uh, the offense took place outside of their jurisdiction, but they did insist that the Africans be freed, and then they pay to return them to Africa. And so I think you're seeing in New England a, um, a, a different approach to the problem of slavery, though the Puritans did eventually engage in um, the African slave trade and the enslavement of Native Americans, unfortunately. Uh, but I think the um, first anti-slavery tract was written by a Puritan minister, 1700. I, I do think there is a spirit of liberty that is... Um, that is in New England that you know took time to 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 germinate, especially with respect to the issue of slavery, um, but it but it did. There is also a question: um, Is there a connection between Pope Nicholas V's doctrine of discovery of fourteen fifty five um, and the uh, Mayflower Compact? This may actually be Alexander's, as I looked this up very quickly, but. Uh, in effect, this is a query, I think, about generally, you know, the, how did the pilgrims um, relate to their Indian neighbors? You know, what were their, what land rights did they recognize of the, you know, Indian tribes, etc.? Well, to start with, when they arrived at uh, what we call Plymouth, they were arriving at a uh, an Indian settlement that had been uh, depopulated by disease. Uh, they recognized that this was not initially their land and eventually they sought to pay for it. They'd also raided a deserted Indian village on Cape Cod and stolen a bunch of uh, corn and other crops that had been left behind. Uh, they sought to pay for that as well. So there was, uh, of course, food is movable goods and paying for that is one thing. 
paying for land is something else. Uh, but on the whole, it appears that they were cognizant that uh, other people had owned land and they weren't simply going to uh, claim it by right of discovery. I have a question connecting this back to, I guess, well, our current polemical moment. Now, what is the main point to be made about the importance of the Mayflower Compact and governance of Plymouth Colony as America's beginning versus the 1619 project claim? Well, I guess that one goes directly to me. Um, the 1619 project claim is that the arrival of a ship of uh, the Golden Lion uh, at Jamestown in August of 1619 with 20 some slaves aboard uh, was the beginning of white supremacy in North America and the beginning of uh, chattel slavery in what would become the United States eventually. And that this was uh, the onset of uh, a system that uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, the principal author and editor of the 1619 project calls the slaveocracy, that this is the founding event of what America is, that everything else is a uh, papering over of that. Our ideals were false when they were written, she says. Uh, what happens here is the notions of equality and freedom and liberty were simply masks worn by the white supremacists to try to cover up and justify their abuse of uh, human rights. Uh, that's the nutshell of what the 1619 project is. So it takes the arrival of those slaves in Virginia as the event from which all else stems. Uh, there's a lot wrong with that, including the fact that the slaves brought by the uh, Golden Lion were manumitted very shortly after that. Uh, they were treated as indentured servants and they became free. But let's leave that aside. The, the central claim is that that's the founding event in what was going to become the greater history of uh, the British colonization of North America and our eventual uh, freedom as an independent nation. Uh, the, the claim which I would think has been made amply by uh, Professor Hall and Professor Drysdeck is that that arrival of the pilgrims and the strangers off the coast of New England in November of uh, 1620 is a true seminal event. That is where uh, much of what became our constitutional tradition began, where our sense of liberty as a free self-governing people began. Uh, Jamestown has historical importance in a variety of ways, but it does not become the template for American independence and self-government. Thank you. Um, I, either anybody else want to do that too, or? Uh... Going to defer? Let me just, just say briefly, I agree with Peter 100%. I think, you know, I'm a kind of a political theorist. I like ideas, but I think we cannot neglect the importance of practice. And what's re re really important to note is that American colonists were governing themselves for, what, a century and a half or so before we started getting into an argument with respect to the appropriate authority of parliament over the American colonies. And I think this practice makes a great deal of difference. I, th I think the, this practice was informed by the ideas underlying the Mayflower Compact and they developed and, and they grew throughout American history. You can see this with something like religious liberty. I think it's exactly right to say the Puritans were not very tolerant with respect to religion, but even in Massachusetts Bay under their own authority, they became increasingly um, tolerant so that by the time they get to the late 18th century, I think it's fair to say they're, they're right on the cusp of embracing religious liberty in a widespread fashion. So I would see the ideals of the Mayflower Compact coming to fruition, perhaps in the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, which then form America's more broad experiment in self-government or constitutional government. Let me make, <clears throat> let me add one other observation, and that is, um, we do have this, uh, I think, fascinating experiment in self-government taking place in, in, uh, in Plymouth. And then we have Massachusetts Bay starting uh, a decade later. Um, but I also want to note that uh, how important it is the developments in England are. Uh, because uh, by the time we get to Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, 
England is beginning to descend into a generation of wars, uh, English civil wars. And, uh, and, and what that does is it, it, in a sense, it takes some of the attention England might have otherwise placed on their North American colonies. And it, it frees up these American colonies to begin to develop the habits of self-government. It's one thing to say we're self-governing, but it, it takes a time to build a tradition and certain habits of self-government. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, uh, Americans, especially there in New England, are going to develop the institutions and the processes of self-government that, that's going to make it almost impossible uh, to undo. And, and so uh, uh, Americans are going to have this yearning and desire to assert uh, their independence long before they do so in, in some kind of formal political process. Uh, so I, I think it's useful to, uh, uh, to think about uh, what's going on in England at the same time as we see these colonial developments and self-government taking place. Uh, uh, let, let me just add one more wrinkle to it. Of course, we get to uh, 1649 and, 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 and the English take off the head of of, of, of their king, um, I think that's a profound moment. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to understate the significance of this kind of regicide. And I, and I sometimes wonder, had, had the English not taken the head off, off uh, uh, Charles I literally, would Americans have had the experience the fortitude to take off the head of George III figuratively. And so it's, again, I think it's an opportunity to think about uh, the interplay uh, between what's taking place in the colonies and the habits of mind, the thinking of governance taking place there, and what's going on in England that, that eventually is going to come to fruition in the last third of the 18th century uh, with the Stamp Act and, and, and the series of events that lead up to uh, July of 1776. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to intellectual history. Um, question, as opposed to Old Testament influence on their political thought, were there also, you know, specifically New Testament aspects? Well, if you, if you look at, uh, uh, the answer is going to be yes, right? So uh, certainly the pilgrims and the Puritans draw extensively on the Old Testament. But if you read, uh, you know, even a, a modest amount of their literature, their sermons, if you read, for example, John Robinson's advice to the pilgrims when they depart Holland, you remember he's the, he's the pastor of the church there in, in the Netherlands, uh, it's, it's replete with, with certain uh, uh, advice from the New Testament about how they're to deal with one another, carry one another's burdens, uh, this kind of admonition that would have been drawn from uh, the New Testament. Not to say that that's the only place that you would find that kind of, of advice, but, but certainly uh, he's drawing on both the Old and the New T uh, Testament when he advises uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these, these colonists. Uh, more generally, uh, certainly, uh, the, uh, both the pilgrims and the Puritans are going to grapple with some important texts of, of the New Testament. Uh, Professor Hall, in his remarks, talks about this reformed view of the right of resistance. Well, it's very hard to engage in a meaningful conversation on the biblical approach or biblical advice on a right of resistance without contend contending with Romans 13 the first uh, seven verses. And so as you see uh, colonists and later uh, uh, the founders uh, contend with whether they have a right to resist British rule, uh, at the very heart of that conversation is a careful assessment and analysis of, of what Romans 13 means. In fact, by the time we get to the founding era, Romans 13 may be, may be the most quoted biblical passage in all of uh, the biblical discourse of the age. Um, uh, there are other uh, uh, New Testament texts that are often used, sometimes arguably out of context, especially verses uh, uh, like, like Galatians 5.1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherein Christ has made us free. Uh, this was a very appealing text 
from the Puritans right through the American founders, its appeal to, to liberty. Again, one could debate whether this is a misuse of scripture, but yes, uh, the short answer is uh, there were uh, a number of New Testament texts that loom large in the discourse, not only of, of the Puritans and the pilgrims, but right up through uh, the American founding era. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm always leaving a little minute or a second or so for uh, people to jump in. Uh, Follow-up questions well, on the indentured servants question. Um, did, any, did any servants sign the Mayflower Compact? And uh, more broadly, what was the proportion of indentured servants in the Plymouth colony, you know, going forward? And I, I guess what was their role in Plymouth socially? politically. Well, Doty and Leicester were both servants and they both signed it. Those two I know off the top of my head. There may have been other servants uh, who signed it as well. Uh, once they were in the colony, they had a fair amount of independence. I assume they still were considered Hopkins servants, but they uh, were detailed on all sorts of tasks that went beyond Hopkins' own interest. That might have had to do with that early moment of uh, collectivism that the, uh, the colony took up. Uh, but there are probably better informed answers than that, but that's the one I can give right now. I don't know what percentage of the members of the colony were servants. It was pretty small, the, uh, uh, but to be researched. Yeah. I, I'm going to add one small note here, um, and that is uh, the original document uh, that was signed there in November 1620, to the best of our knowledge, uh, no longer exists. We don't know, you know, we don't know where it is or, or if, if it's still extant. Uh, what we have is, uh, you know, we have this uh, version of it that was uh, published in, in England in 1622, which was probably taken from William Bradford's notes. Uh, and certainly he reproduces the, the Mayflower Compact in his journal, but it does not include the list of the signatories. It's not until Nathaniel Mar uh, Morton, who was uh, essentially the colony's secretary and, and historian, uh, published his history uh, in 1669 that we have a, a, a reproduction of the Mayflower Compact with his list of the signatories. Now, I think his list of the signatories was taken from a list found in, in, in William Bradford's journal. So uh, there's a little bit of, of historical interpretation that takes place there in Nathaniel Morton's uh, version of, of the colony's history. And again, that wasn't published until uh, the late 1660s. So we don't have the actual document with the actual list of the signatories in front of it. There's a, a little bit of a uh, historical detective work uh, that I think is at play in, in drawing up our understanding of who exactly were the signatories. Are there any accounts by outsiders, contemporary? You know, we have, we are, I'm a mariner, I just stopped at Plymouth, here's what these peculiar people are like in you know, one paragraph of my diary. Is there anything like that or do we only have their own internal accounts? Yeah. Well, I, I, I will, uh, I think Professor Hall can probably do better than I am. Yes, there are, there are some. Uh, I don't think you're going to see anything like uh, the more extended history that was available in, in uh, Mort's relation or in William Bradford's uh, uh, journals or in uh, Nathaniel Morton's history that I just mentioned from 1669. Nothing of that scale, but certainly uh, there were a number of people coming in and out of the colony from, from uh, Europe. Uh, there was exchange of letters and so on. And keep in mind, there are many people in and around a uh, Plymouth colony who are not pilgrims themselves, who are a part of the conversation. Uh, they are uh, corresponding with family and friends in England and, and whatnot. So yes, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, historical documentation quite apart from the pilgrims' own account of their experiences. And I'll just build on that. Um, yeah, certainly there are, in, including people like Thomas Morton, the guy involved in the, um, the Mayfold pole at Marymount. He was arrested and sent back to England. 
and he spent a lot of time writing, um, you know, very, very negative accounts of the pilgrims and what they were up to in New England. As you have dissenters that begin to get in New England, um, Quakers and later Baptists and whatnot, Anglicans, interestingly enough, right? Because Anglicans are more or less dissenting from the Congregational Church. They're oftentimes writing their own accounts of what's going on in New England more broadly. So this is going beyond Plymouth and attempting to bring royal pressure to bear on the colonial authorities to grant some space for Anglican churches and Quaker meeting houses and that sort of thing. So yeah, lots of different accounts flowing, flowing, floating around out there, many of them negative. And I, I, I guess the follow-up would be, is there anything of great value and truth we get from those outsider accounts that we don't get from the insider accounts? I, I guess I would say so. So for instance, the, um, you know, the, the, the Quakers, just to pick on a um, one, one dissenting group, are believing they're acting according to God's guidance, inner light, following scripture, the, um, and, and they're complaining about how they're not being tolerated. The Puritans, on the other hand, the pilgrims and Puritans, just consider them to be um, boisterous troublemakers, Anabaptists they associate them with, uh, by which they're thinking back to the bloodbath that, that was Munster. And so, yeah, two very different perspectives going on at, at, at the same time. And it's useful to read both of them to try to discern what actually is going on and why it is going on. Thank you. Um, we're only about five minutes or so from the end of our time. I'm therefore going to ask um, if you would have any sort of concluding remarks that each of you would like to make. And I, I guess I will ask for it in the same order as we started out in, which is, I believe, Professor Hall, Professor Dreisbach, uh, Peter Wood. Sure. Well, let me first of all commend the National Association of Scholars for the series. I think it's great. Uh, Peter specifically has done great work counteracting the 1619 project, putting forth the 1620 um, project a, as an alternative that deserves to be taken very, very seriously, I think. And we've, I think all three of us have said this, the um, pilgrims, the Mayflower Compact, and the practices that they um, instilled in their little republic have had a disproportionate influence on America's experiment in self-government. And so I think um, we, we need to pay more attention to it and honor their contributions. Yeah. Well, I would, uh, I wanna just uh, reaffirm uh, something Professor Hall said in his remarks, and that is, uh, I think there's a, a rather remarkable series of, of constitutional developments that are taking place in New England more broadly. And so when I, when I think about the significance of the Mayflower Compact, I also want to think with about some of this legal developments that are taking place shortly thereafter in Massachusetts Bay that are gonna have a profound impact on, uh, on the way in which Americans think about constitutionalism, uh, think about the rule of law, uh, think about uh, civil rights, religious rights. I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, this, this code written in Massachusetts uh, uh, sh not long after the Bay, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony is, is founded. And, and this is a remarkable document of constitutional import. I mentioned earlier how its first two articles are a very rich articulation of the notion of due process and, and equal protection under the law. But when you dig into the meat of, of the body of liberties, you're gonna find a lot of other interesting developments that are going to resonate down through the centuries in the American constitutional tradition, uh, including a recognition of the right to trial, right to a speedy trial, the protection of private property from, from, uh, from takings uh, for public use without reasonable compensation. Uh, there's gonna be a privilege against self-incrimination, uh, a prohibition against inhuman, the inhumane, barbarous, and cruel punishments. Uh, uh, as Professor Hall mentioned, this requirement of multiple witnesses for the carrying out of capital punishment, and the list goes on. And so what we see here is a, is a, is a richness of, of thought and action in the developing of an American constitutional tradition that, that is going to uh, continue to shape the way we think about uh, our rights and liberties as Americans here in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Peter, 
Well, um, first, I want to thank Professor Hall and Professor Drysdale. Uh, their depth of knowledge on this leaves me something abashed. I, there's so much more that I should know in order to qualify as uh, someone who can talk about these matters, but I, I'm really grateful to have this in our conversation. Um, the uh, knowledge of the constitutional tradition and of the uh, religious background uh, to the pilgrims, I think, are are really indispensable elements in this. Um, we're in this discussion largely because of my fear that America is losing its sense of history and replacing it with a pseudo history. And the reason for this broader set of uh, 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 webinars that the National Association of Scholars is embarking on uh, is that we are now faced with uh, many states, many school districts across the country that have decided that uh, teaching the 1619 project takes precedence. Uh, we also have known for some years that works like Howard Zinn's uh, uh, pseudo history are gaining ground as very popular sources. Uh, who do we blame for this? Well, there's never anyone to blame but ourselves, but the profession of history has uh, turned against much of this uh, aspect of history. Uh, our schools are misteaching it at every level from kindergarten through graduate school. Uh, Americans in general are much less knowledgeable about who we are for the failure of our historians to help us come to uh, terms with these epochs of history. None more important than this uh, early founding, the Mayflower Compact, the creation of Plymouth are signal events which all Americans should know about. Uh, preserving our republic will depend on our uh, recapturing our knowledge of this. It becomes a, a civic duty, if I can use that somewhat stuffy term, that Americans reacquaint themselves with this history. And I hope that this uh, conversation we're having today will be part of that and that will lead listeners, I can see from many of the comments that their knowledge of American history is pretty good, but uh, the, the knowledge of Americans in general of our history is uh, woeful and uh, therefore work needs to be done. We need to uh, rouse up an interest in our fellow Americans to know what actually happened in our past, even though that's sometimes a difficult thing to figure out. So uh, again, thank you to my uh, uh, fellow speakers and to you, David, for moderating this panel. Oh, and, and thank you. And I'll just say again to the people watching this, um, this is all going to be recorded on our uh, YouTube channel. Please check it out. Again, it should be within 24 hours. And frankly, usually it's you know, by dinner time time, if not a little after that. Um, so it will be available. Um, any questions you have, again, please send them to me, randall at nas.org. I will forward them to our panelists. And then um, we, this is you know, the first of a series. Our next one will be on 1776. I believe that is merely one week from today. Same time, same day, Thursday, 2 p.m., March 25th. Um, being moderated by, not me, but uh, Robert Paquette of the Alexander Hamilton Institute for Western Civilization. So thank you all so much. Um, pleasure to ha have all of you uh, giving this a talk, this uh, presentation, and I think I will conclude now. Uh, thank you, everyone, and goodbye.